Now, in order to be more precise about this, we have to talk a little bit about how to think about momentum of a system that has more than one object in it. One of the things we've been doing uh, in talking about objects like like humans and the earth and balls and, and carts and other things is implicitly treating them as if they were just one little particle and located at their center, right? Center of mass, pretty much. Um, there'll be times we won't want to do that, but for right now, this is a perfectly good thing. But we might actually want to define what the momentum of a system that consists of more than one particle, more than one object is, and how we find its center. So this term center of mass actually has a real mathematical definition. So R is always a position. So the position of the center of mass of some system uh, relative to some origin or other can be found by adding up the position of object 1 times its mass plus the position of object 2 times its mass plus whatever divided by the total mass of the whole system. So let's just see what this would mean. So suppose we have, here's a coordinate system, um, and here's our origin. And here's an object that's mass is 10 kilograms. It's a dumbbell, in fact. So let's make it uh, so it's a 10 kilogram dumb. It's it's a 20 kilogram dumbbell. Each end is 10 kilograms. The the mass of the bar connecting the balls is very small. So you know intuitively where the center of mass ought to be, right? Where should it be? Right there, right? Yeah, it should be there. So what does this definition tell us? Well, we have what's R1? Well, that'd be the vector from the origin to this object. What's R2? Well, that's going to be the vector from the origin to the second object. And vectorially, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to multiply this vector by 10, and that vector by 10, and add them together and divide by 20. And we can see graphically that this is actually going to work out. Let's, let's just do the addition graphically on a scale where multiplying by, here's what we'll do. We will Take this vector, move it here, try to draw it right. So put these things tip to tail to add them. So here is the vector. That's the sum. And if we go halfway up this vector, we find it actually goes to the center of mass. So it works out. It works out graphically. Um, let's take a situation where the masses aren't equal, and we'll make it geometrically simpler, so we have a chance to. So here's our coordinate system. We have one, two, three. So here's object one. And its mass is 2 kilograms. Maybe I better make it smaller. 2 kilograms. And here's object 2. And its mass is 10 kilograms. And these two objects are our system. So where's the center mass of this system? Where should it be? Are they connected? It doesn't actually matter, according to the definition. They could be two binary stars orbiting each other. They could be two particles that, that aren't even interacting at all. So there doesn't really have to be, in fact, for our dumbbell here. 
Suppose the dumbbell, instead of being connected with a rod through the center, there were two rods connecting the edges, but nothing here. Okay, the center of mass would still be here. There doesn't have to be an atom there. Okay, it's, it's just this weighted average of kind of the center of the object that it might rotate around. So where would the center of mass of this system be? Is it going to be in the middle between them? No, it isn't. It's going to be over here somewhere, isn't it? Yep. And so let's see how that would work out. So here would be R1, and that would be 1 meter. And that would be R2, and that's 3 meters. So let's work it out. Our center of mass would be, this is 2 kilograms times... 0, 1, 0 meters, and that's 10 kilograms times 0, 3, 0 meters. And we're going to divide this whole thing by 2 plus 10 kilograms. So we're going to get 0, 2, 0 plus 0, 30, 0 divided by 12 is going to be 0, 32 over 12, 0 meters. And what is that? That's about, that's going to be something like 0, 2.5. Six seven zero meters, and so one two two thirds seems to put the center of mass right about there. So more or less exactly where you thought it ought to be. Okay, so why are we bothering with this whole thing? Well, because we need to define the momentum of a multi-particle system. So let's get our center of mass definition over here. Uh, total mass. Well, if we take the first derivative of this, so the velocity of the center of mass is just the rate of change of the position of the center of mass. And that's going to be m1 uh, and so we have dr1 dt, that's just v1, m2 dr2 dt, that's velocity of 2, divided by m total. And so if we rearrange this, we take m, we just multiply both sides by m total V center of mass, this seems to be the sum of M1 V1 plus M2 V2 plus whatever they are, however many particles. And if this thing is moving slowly compared to the speed of light, then this is going to be P1 plus P2 plus So it looks like we could call this the total momentum of the system, and it's just the sum of the momenta of all the, the objects in the system. Okay, not a big deal. So we could actually write the, the old form of our momentum principle for a multi-particle system as P system final total is P system initial plus F net delta T, where this is the total momentum of the system. Or we can write it this other way. Now, one of the, one of the key features of this that's interesting is that we're talking, this is the net force due to the surroundings even though the objects inside the system can be interacting. 
So it seems like the objects inside, the interactions of objects inside the system can't change the momentum of the system. And this turns out to be important, and it's because of our old friend reciprocity. So let's see if we can see an example of how this might work. So let's consider a system of a proton and an electron, say. So here's our proton. Here's our electron. That's our system. And they're near the surface of the Earth, so the Earth is exerting forces on them. So this is our system. And what are the forces on the system? Well, there's this gravitational force due to the Earth. And there's a gravitational force due to the Earth here. The electron's less massive, so it's actually smaller. And then they interact with each other, of course. So there's this electric force. So, so for the total system in the next few seconds, how is its momentum going to change? There are all these, there's forces due to the Earth, which is outside the system, part of the surroundings, but there are these internal forces too. And of course, so they're going to start moving toward each other, but they're also going to fall because of the Earth. So we can write this equation. Um, so we can say, we'll call this, well, we say this is on plus, and that's minus. So we can write the equation. The change in momentum of our system, which is the, the plus and the minus of an electron and a proton, is going to be equal to what's the net force? Well, it's F gravitational on the proton plus F gravitational on the electron plus the electric force of the proton on the electron plus the electric force of the electron on the proton times delta T. But what do we know about these electric forces? Equal and opposite. So this adds up to zero. And it looks like the change of momentum of the system just depends on these external forces. F gravitational on the proton plus F gravitational on the electron delta T. Now, what's the momentum of the system? Well, it's the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass. Notice that even if these things move together, the center of mass is going to stay where it was, which is relative to these two things. But it'll be falling downward. So that's fairly, that's fairly profound. Internal forces to a system. We define our system any way we want, any number of particles. We can call the whole solar system a system. We've got all the planets and all their moons and the sun and the asteroids and all that stuff out there that isn't planets anymore like Pluto. And they're all interacting gravitationally. And yet, if we find the center of mass of the solar system and consider the, mo the total momentum of the solar system, all these internal interactions don't change the total momentum. So one of the things we can do in this is to consider collisions. Collisions of two objects where momentum can flow from one to the other like we saw. Or some other things can happen too. Here's another possible collision. So we saw momentum flow from cart one to cart two. This can happen too. What happened there it was different. 
they stuck together, didn't they? So in a case where things could stick together, it's probably, it's really complicated. You can't really consider this as part of the surroundings because it gets stuck to this. So you want to say this: these two objects are the system. This is a very practical application of what looked very abstract a minute ago. A system can consist of two objects here. And so now what happened to the initial momentum of the system? Well, it, the, the speed was slower. But what happened? The mass, did, what's the system? Did the mass of this, what are we taking as a system? Here's this thing, here's this thing where we have to be super precise. Okay, I'll, when we're doing physics calculations, when we're sort of talking about it, waving our hands, we can say what we want, but we have to be very precise about describing what happened. I know there was an eraser somewhere, there it is. Um, because we're going to make mathematical errors if we don't. So we better actually start out defining our system and then sticking with it. So it's going to be an incredible mess if we just take one card as the system because they end up stuck together. So we better take the system as both cards. That means the surroundings. Well, of course, there's a lot of stuff in the surroundings, isn't there? But during the moment of this interaction, from right before the time they hit each other to right after, there were, the interactions in the surroundings weren't that significant. There's friction, but it, it didn't slow them down very much. There's air resistance. So right before to right after, we can say that the surroundings were negligible. Because this is a case of a collision. It occurs over a short time. There's a big internal force. Uh, negligible interactions with the surroundings. And almost always con when considering a collision, it's going to be useful to take both objects as the system. So that means if there were negligible interactions with the surroundings, we should be finding that the momentum of the system didn't change, right? That's what should be happening. So let's see if that works. Um, so what do we got here? We had the change in momentum of the system, which is equal to P final minus P initial. We're asserting is zero because F net delta T due to the surroundings is zero. So we should get that the final momentum of the system is equal to the initial momentum of the system. So let's see what that is. Well, initially there were two carts. The first cart has a mass of about half a kilogram. How fast do you think it was going? This is, uh, track's two meters long. This distance is a meter. So a half a meter per second. Okay, so 0.5 meters per second. Let's just take x components for now. So we're going to talk about x plus 0. So we had, specifically, we had 0.5 kilograms, but 0 meters per second for the second cart. So that's the... That's the initial momentum of our system. Well, we're going to write the final momentum of our system. Well, both these things are going the same speed, right? Because they're stuck together, so they have to be going the same speed. 
So what we're going to write here is 0.5 kilograms plus 0.5 kilograms times whatever the final speed was, right? So we should be able to solve for the final speed. So we have 0.5 kilograms times 0.5 meters per second divided by 1 kilogram here. It's too bad these were, it's awkward that it's 5. Let's call this 0 0.6 just so we can distinguish here. So we have 0 0.6 meters per second. So this came out to what? 0.5 times 0.6 should be 0.5 times 6 would be 3.30 kilogram meters per second divided by 1 kilogram. So that looks like it's going to be 0.3 meters per second. It looks like it's going it should be going half as fast because the momentum got shared between the two cards. Does that make sense? Does that look kind of like look like what happened? Well, not if it doesn't stick, it doesn't. Bad Velcro. Okay, we'll do it a little slower. Yeah, maybe about half as fast. So the momentum principle predicts this. Now here's the interesting thing. Would we have been able to write an equation describing the force that one cart was going to exert on another? It's not a gravitational force. They're not charged. It's it's all these little hooks, Velcro hooks. That they're made of protons and electrons, but there are a lot of them. We have no idea what that force is. We didn't need to know. We could actually predict that whatever this interaction is, if they stick together, the momentum principle says the total momentum of the system isn't going to change in that collision. So we know what's going to happen. Okay. So let's consider a different collision here. Consider the following thing. We have an outer space. We've got a ping pong ball and a bowling ball. So ah, bowling ball, ping pong ball. Floating in outer space. Ping pong ball bounces off the bowling ball. And it's pretty obvious what happens to the ping pong ball. Why, why is the effect on the ping pong ball so much bigger than the effect on the bowling ball? What do you see there? Why are we doing this in outer space? No gravity, no friction. It's, it's, it's much simpler, isn't it? All these other interactions are gone. OK, so 60% for 3 40% for 2. Now, Three is correct. Why isn't two correct? Not the momentum, but the change in momentum. Right. Right. The change in momentum has to be the same, just like dropping the tennis ball near the earth. Okay? This, these are electric interactions. The ping pong ball colliding with the bowling ball. Uh, where the ping pong? There it is. It's all these little electrons and protons, electrons interacting with each other. It's electric interactions, reciprocity. So if we take the system, if we say the system is both balls, wow. If we say the system is, there are a lot of interactions down here, aren't there? In, we're not in outer space. So if we say the system is both balls, there was no interaction with the surroundings, the total momentum of the system didn't change. That means 
Whatever the change in the ping pong ball's momentum was, the change in the bowling ball's momentum has to have been equal and opposite. Now, the momentum change is equal and opposite. Is the velocity change equal and opposite? No. No, it's not. And that's so so you have to be precise here. Yes, you notice a much bigger effect in the change in the ping pong ball's velocity. But the bowling ball's momentum changed just as much. Why doesn't its velocity change as much? It's huge mass, right? So let's see what happens here. Well, the, the ping pong ball's momentum changed a lot, didn't it? This didn't seem to move. Is this violating this principle? What's going on here? It's not an isolated system, is it? So there's a huge amount of friction between the table and the ping pong ball and the bowling ball. So in fact, the surroundings this is interacting with is not just this ball, but this ball and the table. So in fact, the momentum of the surroundings did change, but it's the momentum of the bowling ball plus the table. And so the change in speed was very, very small. Okay, let's see if we can um, think about the following situation. This is, this is a standard physics problem. People are always shooting bullets into blocks of wood and then asking you to solve for, for a final speed. The idea is that this is, this is a collision, the epitome of a collision because it happens really fast. The forces in the internal to the system of the bullet and the block. And we're going to take the bullet plus the block as a system because they stick together. Um, so we want to find the speed of the block just after the bullet embeds itself in it. So the question is, which of these equations is the right equation to use given the momentum principle for our multiparticle system? The system is the bullet plus the block. Okay, and it's it's very similar to what we just did with those two carts, right? No, it's 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 just on a nearly frictionless surface. We all like frictionless surfaces, even though we find it very hard to produce them. But but ice can be pretty slippery, as you may have found if you tried to drive on it last week. Uh oh. Uh oh. All right. One and four. Well, what's our system? The bullet plus the block. So what's so we're gonna have change of momentum of the system better be zero. So what's the initial momentum? That's gonna be the mass of the bullet times the initial velocity of the bullet plus zero. So that looks like the right hand side is okay. But now what's the final momentum of this? We've got the the velocity of the block and what's the They're both moving at the same velocity, aren't they? So we're going to have the mass of the bullet plus the mass of the block times the final velocity of the block and that looks like 